Welcome to Cryptocurrencies, the future of digital money show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are thrilled to be welcoming back to the show, Mr. Trace Mayer. Trace is one of the best crypto entrepreneurs, investors, and analysts in the industry. He is an expert in crypto assets, blockchain technology, and gold. He holds degrees in both accounting and law, and he is the host of the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. It's always so interesting to have Trace on the show because not only is he incredibly knowledgeable about Bitcoin, he also has incredible knowledge as far as the history of money. So he's always fascinating to listen to. Trace, welcome back to the show. How are you today? Oh, great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. It's always fun to be on your show. And uh, yeah, let's get right into it. It's always amazing. We know you must be very happy now that Bitcoin is back up over $10,000, right? <laughs> well, yeah, it's always nice to be able to uh, to afford breakfast again. Yes. You know? <laughs> right. it, uh, we, we had some lean times during a uh, Bitcoin winter. Uh, we seem to be in uh, spring, though. You know, we go in cycles because of the four-year happening and, and all of that. And uh, yeah, actually, it's a, it, the price has gone up a little bit too fast for me. I, I, I've, sold some, uh, I've sold some covered calls. You know, I really like doing that because it generates income on my Bitcoin. Uh, but, you know, when they get in the money, then sometimes they get exercised. And uh, so it's a, it's a dual-edged sword for me, that rising price. But, you know, I, I have to get the U.S. dollars anyways in order to pay taxes. So I guess whatever, you know, like... Uh, I guess we can't complain about the rising price, but I mean, I, I really like it when the covered calls expire worthless and then that way I'm only selling volatility and I don't actually have to sell any Bitcoin. Um, but you know, sometimes you just have to get those dollars uh, for whatever reason. And so, you know, being able to sell the covered calls, you get that premium. And then if the price does move up, yeah, you, you sell a little bit of the Bitcoin in the process. And so you can have a very disciplined uh, way of kind of moving out of your position if you need to for whatever reason. You know, because we, we have, you know, some people might have student loans or they might have mortgages or they might want a new car or, or they might have medical expenses or, I mean, there are a lot of reasons uh, that someone might want to uh, sell, you know, and, and selling those covered calls, that's a way you can generate that USD. Uh, and, and then, you know, when they expire worthless, you can actually turn around and sell puts because that completes the market. So you can sell puts and then you actually buy more Bitcoin that way at the lower prices. Uh, so, you know, trading the derivatives on Bitcoin has just been fantastic for me. Uh, but it always does kind of sting a little bit when I actually get called out of the position, uh, even though the price is up. <laughs> right. Now, Chase, talk to us about what covered calls are for everybody that might not be familiar with the term. Also puts. Yeah, so options are, are a fantastic way. Um, to hedge a lot of the risk uh, that, that comes from holding any type of an asset. So, and these are traded widely. You can, you can buy and sell covered calls or puts on gold, oil, wheat, uh, Tesla shares. You know, that's a fun one to play with. Um, any, any major stock pretty much. And what these options are is it's the right, but not the obligation to sell or to buy uh, the underlying, uh, whether that's a commodity or a stock, some people use it for real estate, um, at a particular strike price on or before an expiration date. So there are both European style op options and American style options. And the difference is whether you can exercise the option before the expiration date or not. I like to sell options where they can only be exercised on the expiration date because uh, that, you know, helps, uh, you know, makes a little bit more clear for me, you know, on planning cash flow and everything because the price will go all over the place between the time when you sell the, the option or, or buy the option. And, you know, they're, 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 a great, they're a great tool because you can also buy the options. So, uh, for example, because what, what goes into the pricing of the option, and this is what the Black-Scholes model is about, is it, it's, you have time, you have the option premium, and that's what the option costs. And it's a function of the time that's left on the option, and then the intrinsic value that the option may or may not have. 
and then also the volatility. And so what's great about these is that you can actually, if you're a hardware of last resort on, the, on Bitcoin, you can carve out a little bit of your, your, your portion of that Bitcoin and you can sell the volatility on top of that Bitcoin, right? Because as a hodler, you're, you're taking on that volatility anyways. So why not, why not hedge a little bit of that by selling some of the volatility with an out of the money option? That's where uh, you're selling, say Bitcoin's $5,000 and you sell a $10,000 strike, that's out of the money. Uh, so, you know, you're, in that way you can get paid uh, you can turn your Bitcoin into a cash flow generating asset. And if you, if you time the buying or the selling of the, of the options at the right time, you can do really well. Uh, for example, when Bitcoin was at like $4,000 in December, 2018, remember it's like bottom of crypto winter, Bitcoin's dead again. Like the markets, there's like no volatility. It's just humming along, but not going up or down. So, so we're at a $4,000 spot price and we have a very low vo volatility. So the, the price of the options was very low. And, and then I looked at the mayor multiple. You know, I didn't coin the term, Preston did of the investors podcast, but you know, I love, I love using that indicator. Mm -hmm. And at the time, the mayor multiple was, was at like a 0.6. Right. And, uh, and so what I did is I decided, you know what, I'm going to buy some options. You know, I don't know. I don't need to only sell options. I can buy options too. Uh, and, and since the mayor multiple was really low, my reasoning is that it's going to return back to at least 1.0, you know, because that's the, just the current price divided by 200 day moving average and just standard deviation wise, it's going to return back to that. And since volatility is low, I might as well buy the option and that'll give me a better return in Bitcoin than just holding the Bitcoin itself. So I actually bought June 2020 5K strike call options in December of 2018. And I only had to pay $1,100 per option. Think about that. Wow. There, the intrinsic value today is six thousand right. dollars, right? Because it's yeah. it's a like ten thousand. Well, fifty two hundred dollars, ten thousand two hundred minus five thousand. Right. So they're worth fifty two hundred dollars intrinsic. Plus, I've got the right, but not the obligation to buy all of those bitcoins at five thousand dollars between now and June. So I've still got almost five months of time left on those options. So I only had to tie up $1,100 of capital to control a whole Bitcoin at the time. And so that's why I get that leveraged gain on that, right? So not only has Bitcoin gone up, but the value of the option has gone up at a faster rate than the Bitcoin has. Yeah. So, so I love these options. I love them for buying. I love them for selling if you do them at the right time, right? Because then when I, then when I had those options, well, since I bought them, now I could sell options and I was still hedged on the upside, right? Because, because if I sold an option, and, th and this is actually what I did. Remember, Bitcoin kind of ran up to $12,000 $12, back in uh, July, August timeframe. And the mayor multiple got up to like two, over 2.0. Over 2 so I was like, that's a pretty high mayor multiple. So since I already owned the June 5K options, the strike, 5K strikes, I just turned around and sold 12, 11, 12, and 13K strikes in July and August because the mayor multiple was high right. and volatility was high. So guess what happened? We had a little bit of a correction, which the mayor multiple kind of portented, right? And all of those options I sold expired worthless. But in some cases, I got more option premium for those than what the 5K strikes cost me. And the whole time I was selling monthly options too, right? <laughs> so like trading the derivatives, uh, the, trading these derivatives on Bitcoin, like they're fantastic if you do it right. And, uh, and, and so, you know, I, 
yeah, you want to buy and hold Bitcoin, but you got to be sophisticated. And, you know, the bear market is the time to be doing a bunch of research because it's like, just because the price of Bitcoin goes down doesn't mean that you can't be making money. You can be selling, you can be selling covered calls the whole way down. They're expiring worthless. You're taking the USD proceeds and selling puts and buying the Bitcoin at that lower price because you get the option premium on the put too, right? And, and actually, the put premiums, when Bitcoin was like 8,000 bucks, I was selling $7,500 puts about three weeks out and I would earn about 20 to 30% annualized percentage rate on that USD. So it's way better in a bank account. So, so you know, those are, those are some ways that you can use these, these Bitcoin derivatives to really enhance the performance in your portfolio and also to just hedge your risk because mm-hmm. you're, you're hodling you know, if you're, if you're hodling a bunch of Bitcoin and you definitely should, you know, risk-free asset, ultimate collateral should, should hodl the, hodl the bejesus out of that stuff. <laughs> um, but, but there's a lot of volatility to doing that. And you might as well get paid a little bit on some of the, the, the amount you're hodling, you know, earn a little bit on that volatility because that price is going to go up and down all over the place. And you might as well capture a little bit of the volatility if you can. Yeah. Yeah, I think most people don't realize um, the wizardry that can go into, <laughs> you know, the trading of Bitcoin. People just buy it and they, they sell it. They don't realize that once you get sophisticated at um, knowing really what you're doing, the types of things that you can actually do. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, we, there, there, there's, a, there's a bunch that's happening here, right? You got the, you got the seven network effects. You got speculation, merchants, consumers miners, developers, financialization, and world reserve settlement currency. Now, the hodlers of last resort are the most, well, the buyers of last resort are actually the most important. Those are people who are going to buy when nobody else will, right? They'll catch the falling knife. That takes the most conviction of any, of any particular class. The next most important, and they're right there with the buyers of last resort, are the hodlers of last resort. And that takes a bunch of conviction. You know, when, when we have crypto winter, when Bitcoin's dead, like when, when Mt. Gox fails, like to be a hodler through all that stuff, like that's hard, right? It takes a lot of conviction. So that first network effect of hodlers and buyers, like that's, those are the most important, right? But they're buying something that's been crafted by, by wizards, by mm-hmm. the Bitcoin wizards, the software developers. That's a fifth network effect. So it's the fundamentals you know, of the, of the code and the software that the buyers and hodlers are buying, right, is what the wizards have crafted. But what you're getting to is this six network effect of the financialization. And that's a different circle of magic. You know, you've got the software developers that are building the underlying technology, but the financialization, that's, that's a form of financial magic, right? Like that's different from software development magic. and and so, you know, really, you want to you be competent across this whole spectrum of the different types of magic that you can wield. And then you also want to become, you know, you, you can start off as a minnow, right? But you want to become a bigger fish because there's always a bigger fish. And then you might become a dolphin. You might have a couple hundred Bitcoin. Maybe you become, maybe you become a whale. You know, whales have like, couple thousand, maybe 10, 20,000 Bitcoins. But, but then there's the dragons, mm. right? And dragons, they eat whales like for lunch. <laughs> and the dragons, I mean, they have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin. And, and the dragons, you know, they're the, they're the really big buyers and hodlers of last resort because they can use so much, they, they can use just a small bit of their Bitcoin to sell the covered calls and reacquire as much as a whale has, right? Mm-hmm. Because, because, I mean, they're dragons. They're huge. And, they, and they're, they're like smog. They just like sit on their piles of Bitcoin like crazy. And, they, and they're always acquiring more Bitcoin because they're selling the covered calls just on a small portion. Maybe it's just the Bcash proceeds or maybe just the Bitcoin gold proceeds, Right. And, and they might be able to sell covered calls with just the proceeds from a couple of those forks that enables them to buy 50, 100, couple hundred Bitcoins a month, 
right? So like, you, like th- those are kind of the players in the landscape. And if you get a dragon that's lined up with some wizards, software developer wizards, and then the dragon has, has competency and financial magic also, you know, that, you know that, that's what we're dealing with uh, as this space gets increasingly sophisticated. Because we have a lot of people coming in from Wall Street, like backed and CME options and all of the, like, there's a bunch of very sophisticated financial wizards that are coming into the space, but they're going to have to, they're going to have to deal with the software wizards and then the whales and the dragons, right? Because the dragons have the ultimate collateral. So, you know, the, this is going to get really, really interesting and really, really fun as we move forward because Bitcoin is strictly limited in amount and these dragons, they don't have to give up any of their Bitcoin because they can just sell volatility and buy more Bitcoin. Right. And, and that makes the Bitcoin more and more scarce. Uh, so, so this is going to be, you know, and then you've got miners, right. But the miners are kind of like, the miners are kind of like hordes of orcs, right. They're, they're very mercenistic. They'll switch from one coin to another, whatever's more profitable, whoever's going to feed them best. Uh, the orcs don't really have any power compared to a dragon. Uh, but the orcs are still very important because they provide that security and that proof of work and like all that difficulty that goes into a coin. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, the miners, you you gotta like the, the dragons and the whales, they have to pay the miners through inflation. So that stock to flow ratio that Plan B has really written a lot about, that that shows how much the the dragons and the whales are paying the the miners to secure the coin. Because there's always this tension between miners and hodlers because a miner's revenue is a hodler's expense. And so the hodlers, you know, they wanna they want their expenses to be as low as possible. And the miners want their revenues to be as high as possible. But like orcs, what, what, what's, a, what's a horde of orcs going to do against a dragon? <laughs> like seriously, right? Like he'll just eat them all. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what we saw happen with, with Bcash, right? And mm-hmm. with all these forks is like, you know, the, we, we, had a, we had a Chinese whale and, and the Chinese whale just got feasted on by a bunch of Bitcoin dragons. It was like, oh, you got a hundred thousand bitcoins? <laughs> like, that's cool. whale. <laughs> like, we'll just eat them. We'll just eat the whale, right? Oh. And so, so, so that's kind of how the dynamics of, you know, that's what the landscape and the the universe looks like. You know, with the network effects, the people who are in the different network effects, uh, the different actors, and you can move in and out of the different network effects, right? Like, just like a dragon could could become the biggest, baddest orc horde easily by just allocating some of his Bitcoin into mining equipment, you know, think about right, it. Right. And that, that's a, that's a veto. That's a veto power that the early adopters have over, you know, the current mining space and everything like that, that, and Satoshi, I think kind of built it in that way on purpose. So, you know, just because, just because you're not in what, you know, you, you get to choose what network effect you're going to be in. Uh, but just remember, like that's that's who's playing. Those are the different characters. Those are the different roles that are that are at work, and uh, and you really don't want to make a dragon mad, you know, because like they just have so many resources. I mean, they make whales look small, right? right. And they eat them. They they feast on whales. So <laughs> like you, like you get you just have to be you just got to be aware of like who the players are. And what the what the space looks like, and now that we have Wall Street coming in, it's like okay, Wall Street. Like, what are you going to do? You're going to bring fifty billion dollars of USD. That doesn't necessarily get you more bitcoins, because the dragon, like, he's not even going to give up one coin of this hoard, mm-hmm. right? right? He's just going to sell you volatility, and then acquire more bitcoins and increase the size of his hoard. So he's going to bleed you out of all your USD and convert it into more Bitcoin on a, in, into a stack. Uh, so, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see how this happens. And then, you know, you get these cash settled futures, but like, you know, with the rising price, there's bound to be like more forks and airdrops and all types of stuff like that, that happens and cash settled Bitcoin, like you're not getting that stuff. Right. So like, uh, 
<laughs> you're, you're going to be, we're, we're going to see dislocations and price discovery and, and all types of things like that. But yeah, it's going to be really fun. Or th this next bull market is going to be really, really fun because we have s the pipes into crypto land and into Bitcoin. They're just so much more established than they were last time. Uh, you know, the infrastructure, everything can just handle so much more capital flowing into it. Speaking of infrastructure, I want you to list for everybody the investments that you made early on in the different companies for people that might not be familiar with the way you've actually been behind building this industry. So list the companies that you invested in, please, Trace, <laughs> and also describe briefly what they do. Yeah, well, some of them aren't aren't around anymore. <laughs> you know, not everything works. Right. <laughs> and uh, and 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 I've always, you know, I've always adhered to the HODL strategy. So any of the investments I've made have actually been just a very small portion of the total amount that I've allocated into crypto. Uh, mainly, you know, and I and I differ from like Pantera or Barry Silbert's uh, digital currency group. I differ in strategy that way. Um, but, but yeah, like uh, Armory. I, I, I heavily, you know, I funded Armory because I wanted a custody solution and I got it for myself. And, but, you know, at the time, vast majority of the, like a vast majority of the Bitcoin exchanges and stuff were using Armory. So, you know, it was foundational infrastructure for custody, which is necessary for speculation. Uh, then let's see, funded BitPay, Merchant and Consumer Network Effect. Uh, they've kind of gone off the rails a little bit. Um, uh, funded Kraken, you know, you got to have an exchange if you're going to be speculating. And the mighty Kraken, they've done really well. I've been I've been very happy with the Kraken, uh, the Kraken play. Um, Jesse's just doing a phenomenal job over there. Uh, yeah, sure, there's stuff he, that they could be done better, but like this is a hard space, and running an exchange yeah. is a really hard business. And uh, I think Kraken's just done a phenomenal job um, doing that. You know, haven't lost anybody's Bitcoin. Like, right. that's a big deal, you know. Um, let's see, funded Natagio, which, which was a spin out from gold money. Uh, that, that failed. They were thinking of doing a Bitcoin British pound uh, exchange there. Uh, funded Bitcoin Magazine, where Vitalik got his start. Um, let's see, funded... Uh, I mean, just a whole bunch of different stuff. My own podcast, educational materials to help people understand what's going on, um, different websites, you know, different YouTube videos that have had tens of millions of views and page views and stuff like that, done tons of interviews. You know, that's investing in, in the people that, that come in and become buyers and hodlers of Bitcoin. That's investing in the community. Uh, you know, at my own cost, but helping other people understand the value proposition, uh, the, you know, why they should get it, own it, the thought leadership that goes into that. I mean, all the different conferences that I've flown to at my own expense. I've never been paid, never even had travel comps for like any of these Bitcoin conferences. Like I go to them all, um, you know, paid, paid to do all of that over the years. I mean, when Bitcoin was like five bucks, you know, I helped get the first Bitcoin conference in San Jose all planned and off the ground. So, you know, that's investing a lot in the community and the, in the infrastructure and the thought leadership, the ideas, you know, the seven network effects, the prioritization of the different classes of uh, Bitcoin stakeholders and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So that's a little bit of it. I mean, I don't even, I don't even know probably all the different, I'd have to go look at, look at a list of all the different things I've, I've, contributed to but those are the main ones you know right right you've contributed in such a massive way i don't think some people most people don't realize um the amount of influence and support that you've provided to <laughs> this industry but the main point is that uh, you've backed so many things and not everything works that's the fun of life right you, you can't oh yeah you can't um i saw a twilight zone one time um twilight episode where he wished for everything to work and then everything he touched worked and he was like life was over because there's no <laughs> there's no element of what's gonna happen next right and that's oh, what this yeah. industry is all about 
you got to have entertainment value. You know, like right? it's so much fun chasing the rabbit. It's so much fun, like working and building on projects. Uh, yeah. You know, that's another thing, like during crypto winter, like what, what, what were, what were you doing during crypto winter? Were you studying and researching and working hard and building? And I mean, there, there, you know, I, I've been through a lot of these crypto winners now. Um, and, and during every one of them, I've been working harder probably and more focused and more diligently than, than during the crypto springs and summers. And that's because there's not a price rabbit to be chasing, right? Like I'm, I'm not distracted uh, thinking about price or anything like that because it's not going up 20% in a day like Bitcoin's been known to do. Uh, so, you know, I think that that's an important thing is like what, how have you allocated your own human capital uh, as you get into this space? Because, you know, I think we're going to have to be on the front edge of the technology you need to know what the wizards are doing in the workshop for real. Nice. And, that, and that's even harder because we got so many different coins and so many different white papers and so much, so much stuff out there. Like how do you sift through it all? How do you find the, the diamonds in the rough? Um, you know, so asymmetric knowledge and then economic calculation because profits go to the people who do it correctly and, and losses to the people who do it incorrectly. And, you know, I think we've seen a little bit of, uh, in the bear market, we've seen a little bit of um, closed mindedness start to come into the space. And we should remember that the purpose is monetary sovereignty. The means might be Bitcoin or it might be something else like gold or whatever. And, and back in December, you know, I, I let everybody know we just like Europe just in World War II, we had, we had two fronts, Europe and the Pacific. And I declared that, you know, we're opening a new front in the war for monetary sovereignty. And it's going to be in the privacy, anonymity, fungibility area. And, and actually, just today, Jerome Powell uh, came out with an announcement that he thinks private digital currencies need to be uh, what goes forward because having everything public and trackable and traceable and stuff is just not very good. Um, and so that's coming from the head of the Federal Reserve. So, you know, this Bitcoin, we have definitely taken territory and are winning the war in the front for scarcity. Europe, right? And now it's time to take a little bit of our resources and open a new front uh, in the Pacific. Because we've had some skirmishes going on over there. You know, and we got a couple, we got a couple small frigates over there, uh, Monero, Zcash. You know, we got, we got a little bit of, little bit of skirmishes, a couple small frigates, but I'm talking about like, boom, you know, we need to, we need to deploy some aircraft carriers uh, over, <laughs> over to the Pacific front mm. and, and start, you know, this war for monetary sovereignty, like, you know, so, so in December, that's, that's what I declared. You know, we're opening a new front in the war for monetary sovereignty. The means may be different than Bitcoin, you know, but, but hey, it, as long as it helps accomplish that purpose, the means can be different. And as long as we're just using a small portion of our resources, uh, you know, like it's kind of fun. You know, we, we get to experiment with stuff and, and, and everything like that. So, so I think it's important for people to keep an open mind uh, on these types of things because we, we, you know, that's, hey, I had a hugely open mind about Bitcoin. Right. And I went and talked to the gold bugs and I went and talked to the libertarians. And guess what? A lot of them had a closed mind. Not so much anymore, but they had a closed <laughs> mind when I went and talked to them at, at 25 cents. They had a closed mind when I went and talked to them at five bucks. I mean, I could get the email out from Lou Rockwell, you know, not wanting to do anything with Bitcoin when it was five bucks. Wow. Whoops. You know, like some crusty old troglodyte about Bitcoin. <laughs> I mean, it's to over 10,000 right now. <laughs> how can you like, do this? For now? real. For <laughs> real. Like how bad can you, how, like how bad can your calls be? I mean, it's just <laughs> absurd. Like, I mean, just. Right whatever, you know, but, but Hey, 
you're going to have a closed mind like Lou Rockwell, you're going to get wrecked. You talked about um, Monero and some other altcoins. And outside of Bitcoin, what are your favorite altcoins and why? And where do you see this going? Well, I mean, let's see. I I first had Evan Duffield, the, the lead developer of Dash on my podcast at $3. Dash is like 120 bucks. But I don't really... You know, the reason I had him on was because of the master node. Uh, that was an innovation, you know, but now we got lots of master nodes, uh, coins, PIVX. You know, I mentioned that on Jeff Berwick's podcast. Um, Smart Cash was another small one. You know, I like these privacy anonymity fungibility coins. Um, I like Monero, you know, ring signatures, but Monero is not really scalable and it has... Uh, like it, I, you know, it just, it, it, I don't like hard forking every six months. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just like, that's a lot of code to review. There's a lot of potential pro like stuff could go wrong. I just don't like hard forks, you know? Um, so, you know, the, th that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm at there. But, you know, I think the really big, you know, the one, the one I've been keeping my eye on, you know, the, the coin I've been keeping my eye on, and I actually mentioned it back in December, uh, it's a Mimble Wimble in the base layer coin. And so you have, you, you only have two of them. You have Grin and Beam, and then this coin, uh, Mimble Wimble coin, it forked from Grin in November, mainnet launched, and then it didn't airdrop to Bitcoin holders because I guess it wanted to make friends with dragons or whatever, if it could. You know, because, like, how much do you get the attention of, like, the apex predators, right? <laughs> like, I mean, it, it's hard to get their attention. Okay. Um, but, yeah, when it airdropped December, uh, December 2nd, they airdropped, like, 5.4 million of these coins out. And they had a value of, like, close to a million dollars total. Hmm. I mean, the market cap of this coin was, like, a million bucks. Uh, or 2 million bucks, or I mean, just something de minimis. And it has Mimble Wimble applied in the base layer, which is really cool because, you know, I did, a, I did an interview back in 2015 about removing the smell from Bitcoin and because gold has no smell. And that's what we need in Bitcoin. We need a way to not have a UTXO history. And there, there have been advancements with this, with things like coin join and confidential transactions. Uh, but I just, you know, coin join on Bitcoin, that's a good way to get your, your exchange account like frozen or closed, really. You know, because who knows who you're coin joining your coins with? It could be some North Korean account, right? That's North Korean UTXOs. I mean, yeah. so that, that's very dangerous to, to coin join just willy nilly. And you know, privacy has to be built into the base layer and not be opt-in. It has to be privacy by default, you know, so everybody's using it. So you, you got CoinJoin and that's a tool, but not, not on Bitcoin. I just don't want to do that. I don't want the brain damage, Sketchy. Yeah. you know, cause I mean, when I need, when I need a bunch of USD to pay taxes, I need to know that my exchange account's going to work <laughs> and I need to know that my bank account's going to let those USD in. So I can write the check to the IRS so I don't have problems. Um, then you've got confidential transactions, but like there's a problem with that because like you could have a hidden inflation bug and not, and not be able to discover it, right? Because you, you got to have that limited and amountness. Um, and that's where I really like Mimble Wimble because there was a paper that came out where the, the professors in the paper, the Fuschbacher, the, the, you know, the mathematician, the, the lead author provided the, the mathematical proof for the scarcity of the coins in Mimblewimble. And it has to do with how the excess value is used because what Mimblewimble uses and, and Andrew Palestra did a great presentation on this back in 2016, but it only got like 18,000 views. Like, seriously, what have people been doing during the bear market? Like, why, why aren't you researching the, the best tech out there, right? 18,000 views? I mean, I do single podcast interviews that, 
or YouTube interviews that get 10 times that uh, audience sometimes. So, I mean, maybe people are just totally unaware of Mimble Wimble, uh, but, but that 2016 paper and then Andrew Palestra's presentation, you're, you, what you're doing is you're having coin join and confidential transactions with signature aggregation in the base layer by default. And then with the excess value and the way the mathematical proof works, you're able to have the limited and amountness provably of the coins. So you get, you get the privacy, anonymity, and fungibility, and you get the provable scarcity. Plus, the way that the Mimblewimble gets applied, you get a 3x scalability increase over Bitcoin. So you get scalability increases, which means that you could probably, I mean, there, if, some, if some, you know, wizard coded it up, you might be able to run full nodes on your cell phone. Mimblewimble coin full nodes, right? Because you got that increased scalability uh, performance oh, wow. of 3x, which what's that going to do to help with decentralization and, de and censorship resistance and everything, right? Because you want to reduce the cost of running a full node. That's what the blockchain uh, 2x war was all about, the increasing the size of the coin base and the size of the blockchain. So, so yeah, so I've been, I've been keeping my eye cautiously mm. on potential disruption that could result from Mimble Wimble because, you know, like Professor Christensen just passed away and he wrote The Innovator's Dilemma, a fantastic book. You know, and, and during the 2X wars, I talked a lot about, like, why do we hire Bitcoin? Well, I, I brought that from, from Professor Christensen, you know, marketing genius at Harvard. Uh, why hire a milkshake? You know, what job does it perform? And when you look at Bitcoin, like, why do we hire Bitcoin? Well, we hire it for that scarcity function. Uh, but some people want to hire it for the privacy, anonymity, fungibility. But with Mimblewimble, like, what if, what if we're able to hire, like, what if we're able to have both scarcity and the, 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 the privacy anonymity fungibility that comes from coin join and confidential transactions in the base layer? Mm -hmm. You know, so, so that's something that, you know, hopefully Bitcoin is looking at implementing is Mimble Wimble coin. Uh, I would like, you know, if we could do it safely and securely, I would like to do it in the base layer. Uh, I just don't think doing extension blocks or, or a side chain or something like that is very feasible because then it becomes more opt-in and it changes the game theory and the, the incentives structure. So like Litecoin is looking at doing Mimblewimble coin uh, as an extension block. But I just don't really like that because of the game theory aspects. So, you know, that, that's what I'm talking about is it's part, part of the innovator's dilemma and we know that there's a massive need uh, for the privacy, anonymity, and fungibility. And so, you know, just ideologically, you know, I want to see that front get opened up and resources begin to be allocated over there. Um, and so that, you know, that's why I'm cautiously keeping my, my eye on this, uh, this particular one. You know, I think it might have something to it. Um, and so, you know, I'm cautiously looking at it. Uh, I've gotten a, a little bit here and there to test out the technology. It's really cool to be able to see like transactions on a blockchain, but have absolutely no, it's just a random hash because everything's done with coin join and confidential transactions. Like that's pretty cool to kind of experiment with the tech and see what's going on with it, you know? So, uh, yeah, and that's, that's what, you know, kind of drew me to Bitcoin initially anyways is, you know, we get to experiment on the forefront of monetary technology. Staying with monetary technology and um, shifting gears just a little bit, there is a company called Square. Oh, that, yeah. Uh, yeah, Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter started. Square is a company that is involved in building ways for crypto payments to become easy and simple. Do you believe that there is going to be a true 
transition into a crypto global economy. Do you really think that's where we're headed, Trace? Oh, yeah. I mean, we're definitely headed there. How long it's going to take? I don't know. It could happen really fast. You get companies like Square and Stripe and Braintree and PayPal integrating into all of their shopping carts and stuff like that. Keep in mind, this is software, you know, Bitcoin software, and it's extensible and it's a protocol, you know, so it's kind of like asking, do you really think that we're going to, we're going to be able to book movie tickets from our own house? You know, in 1980, you might be asking that. It's like, you're going to be able to watch movies on a little small device in your hand. (laughs) No, that's just crazy talk. Hey, here we are. Right. And you can book movie tickets from your hand, right. (laughs) From, from, from your cell phone. So, you know, that it's very, I think it's great to see Jack getting involved uh, in Bitcoin the way that he has. Um, He's a tremendous entrepreneur. Um, I don't necessarily agree with how he runs Twitter all the time, but guess what? He's running Twitter and I'm not. (laughs) And that's just how the game is. That's just how the game is done. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can have an opinion, but like get in the ring. Oh, you don't have enough money to get in the ring. Whoops. <laughs> like go figure out how to be an entrepreneur and make enough money so you can get in the ring. Uh, yeah. So, so I think it's great. You know, he's, he's allocating a lot of resources to Bitcoin. He's got like five, uh, five full-time open source devs now, I think in square crypto, they're going to be building out all types of solutions that are going to be super helpful for, uh, for, for implementing Bitcoin and stuff like that. And, and Bitcoin's making them a lot of money. You go look at their quarterly filings and the revenues that they're getting off of their Bitcoin sales and stuff, they're making good money in that area. And hey, like when you start, when you got something that's making you money, like that, that's, that's a signal that, hey, you might want to allocate more resources over here. Um, so, so I think that's going to be great, you know, and, and other companies are going to see that they're making money over there and they're going to start doing crypto stuff too, you know, whether Bitcoin or, or other, uh, other solutions in the space, um, all of that's good. It's the rising tide because we're innovating. It's, it's the innovator's dilemma. Again, like old fiat currency with the new possible replacement, you know, like we're, we're, in, we're going to be in a relentless race of innovation for probably a couple of decades. So all the innovation, the better, you know, uh, don't get too attached to any one thing. Uh, keep those eyes and ears open and uh, constantly scanning for potential disruption and even better be, be the disruptive agent by all means, like be the disruptive agent, be the disruptive. you know, change the world for the better. Uh, you know, it's, that's, that's a great thing to do. Now, Trace, we're watching governments, you know, step in China with its own digital coin and whatnot. What do you see as the pros and cons of um, going completely digital, um, a cashless society that they're speaking of? Because personally, I see some cons to it, Trace, Um, especially with um, portions of the population of the world that are not... um, in fortunate positions, you know, poorer people who use cash and maybe don't even have bank accounts at all and don't have access to this type of digital structure. Talk to us about how they'll be able to adapt into this kind of situation. Yeah, well, we saw it with, uh, you know, people jumped from nothing to cell phones in Africa. They skipped the landline. Uh, Maybe they'll just skip the bank account uh, going straight to, you know, wallet on their phone. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it could be very dis, d- disturbing, you know, something like a, a central bank digital currency run by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, cause, you know, economics is, is science, but there's a lot of political dogma there. And we're seeing how political dogma does not solve problems like coronavirus. You know, you got to have science to solve those types of problems. And, and, and to solve shortages and rationing and rent control and, and all these types of bad ideas, you need, you need solid, good economic science uh, being done and monetary science being done. And so, you know, the, having, 
you know, these central bank digital currencies, they're, they're a big threat, I think, to the liberty and the freedom of the individual. And we really need to have stuff like Bitcoin that's censorship resistant. And even better, you know, like if we can have privacy and anonymity and fungibility and censorship resistant all built into the base layer. I mean, these are all properties of money. And the more properties of money we can have uh, being applied, the better. Good, you know, these good properties of money, scarcity, uh, all of this stuff. Um, there, there are quite a few, like, you know, a lot of, a lot of different properties of money. And, you know, we can compare and contrast the different options out there, use different tools for different reasons and use cases. Uh, and the more options we have, the better. And the more that we're able to acquire these different properties of money and the lower cost of being able to do so, I think that's, that's all the better too. And so we need the innovators and the disruptors to, to build and create these, these different types of tools for us, or we're going to have fostered upon us chains of, you know, central bank digital currencies where they can, where you don't hold the private keys to your money. You know, I mean, where they can just inflate it at will, where they can just seize or confiscate it at will, where they can start charging negative interest rates at will. You know, we, we, need, we need monetary sovereignty where people can't do that, your money, you know, where, where it's scarce and there's nothing they can do about it, where you hold the private keys and run a full node and there's nothing they can do about it, you know, but we have to build that type of stuff. And then we have to have the economic and the political will to keep it there. So, you know, it's, it, this is war, you know, th this is a war that humanity has fought over the millennia. You know, that's why you got Roman coins with emperor's faces like stamped on them, right? Like governments have tried to control the money forever. So, yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a, a big battle. This is a big war that we're, we're in the, right in the middle of. And it's hugely important. And we, we just do not want to get you know, backed into a corner where our only tools are these central bank digital currencies. Like, we don't want to live in that type of a world. Right. You know, it's real interesting that um, I think it was back in the 90s, The Economist magazine came out with what looks like a digital coin on the front oh, cover, yeah. right? So this may have indeed been being planned for a long time, and then Bitcoin came out first. Talk to us about that. It's very interesting. Well, I mean, the, the technology, it's been, out, it's been envisioned. Like, clear back with the first web browser, there was a payment 402 error, like payment method not specified. So, I mean, it's been out there. It's been in the think tanks. People have thought about it. But Bitcoin was that first practical implementation of triple entry bookkeeping and provable scarcity and solving the, the Byzantine general's problem. You know, it's, a, it's been a great prototype of what we're able to do. And then it's, you know, spawned an entire industry with thousands of these altcoins now and all types of experimentation and innovation happening. Uh, it's been wonderful, you know, and, and hopefully we're going to continue that tradition and that culture of innovation and disruption uh, into the future. You know, primarily with Bitcoin, stuff like TAP, Taproot and Graphroot and Mast and Schnorr Signatures and, and all this type of stuff. Like, just keep moving it all forward. You know, let's, the, wi the wizards in the workshop, like, keep, keep building new spells and crafting them and let's start implementing it all, you know, and, and just taking it and running with it, you know, uh, all the better. That's what's so exciting about this industry. I don't think people realize the amount of um, jobs, careers, um, opportunities, entrepreneurs, the amount of business that is being right now created for the population of human beings. And not only that, the innovation that's going to take to bring the poorer portions of our world up to speed. So we can do this, even though there is... Um, a concern that they may not have bank accounts and they may not be, you know, at the moment up to speed. The fact that there's entrepreneurs thinking about this and building that type of infrastructure to bring everybody up at the same time and, in fact, keep us hopefully free from the central bank's scenario of coming in and taking over, right? 
Oh yeah, making lowering the costs in terms of time, money, privacy uh, to get access to these these monetary tools like Bitcoin. You know, it's phenomenal, and there's a lot of oppor- economic opportunity and a lot of chance to make a lot of money doing it. So, like, get to work. You know? That's right. But let's get it done. <laughs> Lastly, I want to talk about your prediction for Bitcoin. It's always interesting to hear your prediction for the price. Also about um, regulations, mass adoptions, innovations. What do you see coming up this year in 2020 and specifically in this new decade? Oh, man, the 2020s are going to be a decade to remember. Uh, The first 10 years has been a proof of concept. Um, These next 10 years, it's actually going to start getting rolled out and deployed in massive ways. We got CME options that started trading in January. Uh, ETFs will probably eventually be approved this decade. Um, we Bank accounts might be denominated in Bitcoins. We've got derivatives already trading on Bitcoin. Um, we're going to get, it's just going to get easier and easier for the average user. The user interfaces are going to get easier. Things like Square Crypto, are going to be building stuff and Bitcoin core and chain code. Uh, Square is going to, you know, and companies like that are going to make it easier to buy it and sell it. Those on ramps are going to get easier and easier. Uh, You know, all of this just makes the migration uh, from fiat currencies and the old legacy systems into the new that much easier. And everybody gets to choose what they do and when they do it. Like it's all voluntary. You know, you, you want, you want Bitcoin, you get to choose when, where, how much, you know, you want to, you want to dink around in some altcoin, go for it. You know, everybody's free to choose on all of this stuff. It's phenomenal. And those who choose correctly will have economic gains and profits. And those who choose incorrectly will have economic losses. And that's just how it's going to get played out. You know, this is phenomenal opportunity uh, for people to, you know, just do tremendously well for themselves financially if they make good choices, like stay out of debt, neither borrower nor lender be, uh, equity based, don't be trading on margin. In fact, don't trade a lot. <laughs> you know, it can really mess with your emotions and you probably aren't going to do very well anyway. <laughs> um, you know, don't be a speculative gambler. Don't be chasing after every altcoin distraction that comes up. You know, like what Meltman uh, when she was in Congress, like there's Bitcoin and then there's <laughs> and had a little bit of an obscenity. Um, you know, like Bitcoin, you know, that Bitcoin, that's a uh, hundred and almost $200 billion market cap. We, we'll probably see trillion dollar plus market cap. Um, stock to flow models got it, got it built in pretty soon. And that's highly correlated with co-integration. You know, what's going to break first, the co-integration or the U.S. dollar? <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it, it, it's just going to be such a massive migration. And we're just in the very beginning parts of it. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic. Stuff's just going to get easier to use. I mean, think about 10 years ago. What were your internet bandwidth speeds? What, like, what Facebook and YouTube and and Instagram and all the Uber, like that stuff just wasn't really all built out the way it is today. You know, this is a, we get a cumulative effect from all this software development. I'm incredibly excited, you know, and Bitcoin's going to be a primary beneficiary of all this stuff. Um, you know, and I, and I think we're going to see new all time highs, you know, if not 2020, definitely in 2021. Um, and it's going to get exciting. We're going to start chasing that rabbit again. Uh, and, and that rabbit's going to be running all over the place. So <laughs> make sure you, you catch that rabbit. It's like get the huddle bag. <laughs> A waskly rabbit. Now, yeah. what, <laughs> what it, do you It's going to go up and down all over the place. Like, you got to catch that rabbit and stick it in the huddle bag. <laughs> make sure it doesn't get away. It's, it's dead in the huddle bag, not moving anywhere. Trace, give us a price prediction. I know you don't like to do it, but give us, um, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I look at Plan B stuff. You know, I put out a tweet. Um, yeah, I think I think hundred thousand dollars by the end of twenty twenty, December thirty first. If it does not do that, 
if it does not go above 100,000 sometime between now and the end of 2021, it will invalidate the co-integration on his model. And hey, that co-integration is serious business statistically. And it's, it's based on billions of transactions being done by tens of millions of unique individuals. So what knowledge is getting expressed in all of that price discovery? Way more than I might be able to know myself. I mean, it's taking, it's taking into account everybody's transactions that's going into that co-integration because it's all about the co-integration on that model. So I'm going to be very surprised if that model gets invalidated. You know, and I and I'm not, and I and I'm planning my own positions, uh, so that I'm not going to get caught very flat-footed in case that model comes to pass. You know, I don't I don't want to be selling covered calls at fifteen thousand dollar Bitcoin. You know, when it could be when it could run to a hundred thousand based on that model. Wow. You know, just hodl, just hodl. You know, it's easy. Hodl gang, like <laughs> hodling, you, hodling is surprisingly difficult for people to yeah. do, but it, but it's actually just so simple. You just go and you buy the, buy that rabbit on the spot market, already skinned, stick them in the hodl bag, you know, Forget cold storage, it. running your own full node, holding your own private keys, throw those, throw those rabbits in the hodl bag and just don't worry about it. You know, you, you hold. You hold Bitcoin for 210,000 blocks, which is a full four-year cycle with the halvening, and you're going to be up in terms of USD, like it's happened every single time. And why wouldn't it? You know, the demand keeps increasing, the supply is getting restricted, the infrastructure is being built out, and owning Bitcoin is like owning an ETF over the entire crypto universe. So, you know, you just just... You know, don't don't be trying to chase that darn rabbit. It goes up, it goes down. I mean, we've seen it today. Ten ten thousand one hundred dollars to ninety seven hundred dollars to ten thousand three hundred dollars. That rabbit's running all over the place. And this is a good example. I'll use this this example. I, I have a friend that wanted to buy some Bitcoin, and I was helping broker the deal, right? And it was a large block of Bitcoin. And I didn't have enough money at the time to buy it. So I kind of had to pass. Because if you're going to be a buyer of last resort, you got to have the resources to do it. You know, hardware of last resort, you can just, you can just stick on it because you already bought it. But to buy more, you actually have to have that financial ability to do so. And, and I didn't have it at the time. And, you know, and, and we, were, we were there with one of my friends and one of my other friends and, you know, one wanted to buy, one wanted to sell. And my, my friend that was buying, he passed on the deal. And the reason he passed is because the spot price was $5. And my, and my friend wanted $5.25 for the large block of Bitcoin. Right? So, so they were just, they were off by, what, 5%? on 200,000 Bitcoin, right? Oh. They, 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 they were off by 25 cents, by 5%. Like, if you knew what you knew now, and, and you were back in 20, 2009 or 2010 or 2011 or 2012, like, what, what would you do? I mean, a 200,000 block a Bitcoin comes along your path and you, and you have the money to buy it. Like, what are you going to do? Are you going to pass on it because the spot price is five bucks, but it was and it's 25 cents over spot. Or are you just going to shoot that rabbit and stick it in the hodl bag? Right. I mean that he could have, he could have bought those coins for about a million dollars and they'd be worth, he'd be worth over a billion dollars today. It's just you know, a classic it, case of if I only knew then what I know now, right? Oh um, my gosh, I I wish I had I wish I had the million dollars at that time to buy that to buy that rabbit when it came across. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> but hey, you know, we we live and learn and and hopefully we're we we've been productive and entrepreneurial and we've built our our ability to 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 be a buyer of last resort. But man, like you know when when you get conviction on something and I, and I had conviction on Bitcoin, 
not as much as I have today, you know, but, but man, if I could go back today, oh, I would have begged, borrowed and, and, and anything I could to buy that HODL stack that, <laughs> that I knew that I could like remain financially solvent with. Right. So, you know, this is, you know, when, when you get conviction on something and you, and you have the opportunity to be a buyer last resort, five, $5 spot and it's 525 to buy it. Just snag that rabbit. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I mean it's like cuz I mean it was so hard to buy bitcoin back then. You know, it, especially in size. I mean to be able to buy bitcoin in size in 2011 or 2010 really really hard thing to do. And so my buddy, you know, that passed on that deal because it was 5 5% over spot. Oh, ouch. You know, ouch. <laughs> And I think it's the the takeaway here is that we might turn around in three to five years and have Bitcoin worth a million dollars. So looking back at this moment in time might be akin to that scenario. So just because now we're at 10,000 doesn't mean, oh, you've missed out. No FOMO. Right. Well, well, I mean, we we definitely have like a lot more efficient markets in terms of like arbitraging price and making it easier to buy and stuff like that. But I mean, Bitcoin is like a storage tank and really any, any asset is right. And it's an empty storage tank. There's only a hundred and hundred, almost $200 billion of value stored in it. I mean, how many, there's 90 trillion in fiat currencies. There's how many, like over a hundred trillion in real estate. There's, there's how many trillions in bonds and stocks, you know, if even a small, tiny percentage of that capital decides to move into Bitcoin because it's sharp ratio is unbelievably awesome and it's uncorrelated and it's equity based. So it's no one's liability and it doesn't need any bailouts and you can hold the keys yourself. You know, if, it, if just a tiny percentage of, of total investment monies were to reallocate into Bitcoin, and the thing is, is Bitcoin, Bitcoin, that storage container can fill up. You know, there's, there's no real limit or cap on that. You know, Tesla shares or Facebook shares, ultimately, you know, there's a methodology that goes into valuing stocks and real estate and stuff like that. But when you're dealing with a sterile asset like gold or U.S. dollars or Bitcoin, there, there's not really an investment methodology for valuing it. That's why this stock to flow ratio uh, uh, paper by plan B is so interesting because it's bringing a little bit more analytical uh, and quantitative analysis to valuing Bitcoin. You know, I've just kind of gone intuitively on gut instinct. Yeah, you sure You know, but, but he's bringing stock to flow to bring more discipline to it and finding correlated co-integrated relationships. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see whether that continues to play out, but, but we can, we can definitely have like that type of growth in terms of the, um, in terms of the market cap, you know, it, it definitely has that potential to grow that. Right. And just to clarify, it could, it could have $50 trillion market cap. Bitcoin could, right. So like, but, it, but it's possible. I mean, what other asset out there do we have where it's possible for it to go to, to have this type of a massive gain? Gold, gold, that storage tank is already filled up with $7 trillion of capital, right? Like, but the Bitcoin storage tank is still relatively empty and other assets in the crypto universe. Uh, although most of them, I think, are just distractions and scams. But, um, <laughs> right. you know, but you know, it's, it's going to be an interesting decade, you know, to get back to your question, you know, for, it's going to be a very interesting decade. (laughs) Fun to be right in the middle of it all. It is amazing to have you on this show every time. And yes, we are. We're going to be right in the middle of it all. Please tell everyone a little bit about your podcast, your Bitcoin knowledge podcast and how they can follow you. Yeah. So just at Trace Mayer on Twitter and uh, www.bitcoin.kn is uh, where you can find that Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. 
And I interview the top people in the Bitcoin space uh, and in the crypto space. Uh, so, you know, it's a lot of fun. We get to have some conversations with uh, movers and shakers. Yeah, it's an amazing podcast. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks so much for having me and keep up the good work. Mr. Trace Mayer, investor, journalist, and host of the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. For Cryptocurrencies, the Future of Digital Money show, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.